So thank you very much. I, it's an incredible honor to be here um, with all of you, and I want to thank the, the, uh, the leadership of IWAF, uh, uh, to Ke Kevin O'Connor and the Governor of the Affairs Shop, um, and most importantly, thanks to all of you for, uh, for both for your service uh, to your communities uh, as professional firefighters, um, and also for your service to your country uh, in speaking up to our elected officials uh, on the importance of not only the services that you provide, but the services that um, our state and our local governments provide to all of our families and communities. Um, uh, your work is incredibly important, not just for all of us now, but really uh, for laying the foundations of future economic growth. Because right now, everyone is talking about jobs, everyone's talking about the economy. We know that a strong public sector is so essential to having the kind of economic growth continue into the future that we've experienced already. So thank you all. Uh, it has been an incredibly challenging, for those of us that work on state budgets, it has been such a challenging um, few, few years. I'm going to talk about the adequacy of funding for public services. Um, and that's been something really tough over the last four, four years. Um, I'm going to talk about three things in particular. What we're seeing out around the country uh, as a consequence of inadequate funding, why it exists, and, and most importantly, what we can do about it, both from a policy perspective um, and from an organizing perspective. Um, let's skip past the, uh, the budget graph and get onto the, the, the human impacts we've seen. Since the budget began, since the recession began four years ago, nearly every state has acted to fend off budget shortfalls that have just been enormous. At least 30 states have cut back the availability of health care services. 25 states have cut funding for seniors and people with disabilities. 30 states have cut funding for local school districts. Uh, in fact, 16 states are funding education per pupil right now more than 10% below what they were doing four years ago. Going backwards is not acceptable in K-12 education. Almost every state has raised tuition, laid off, uh, uh, um, um, laid off university staff or otherwise made cuts at colleges and universities. And in almost every state, as you know, public employees have faced furloughs, pay freezes, pay cuts, increased pension costs, or otherwise took a hit as a result of the budget cuts. It's been a really tough four years. And this is just at the state level. This doesn't even take into account the additional cutbacks that we've seen at the local level over the last few years. There are tens of thousands of units of local government in this country, most of them reliant on state aid or on property taxes uh, that are taking a hit. And that turns again into cutbacks in public services. Let me skip one more. Um, one of the consequences of the budget cuts of the last four years has been a really sharp decline in our public sector workforce. The red line on the slide you see here uh, is people who work in education, school teachers, support staff, university employees. Uh, employment in public education is now at its lowest level since 1999, the result of what's happened over the last four years. The blue line is everyone else who works for a unit of state or local government. Public safety, utilities, streets and sanitation, highway maintenance, and so forth. As a result of what we've seen over the last four years, public sector employment outside of education is at its low, lowest level since early 1986. Uh, and if anyone else in the room here is from Chicago, you know that that means that we haven't seen it this bad since the last time the Chicago Bears won the Super Bowl. Oh. Hey, where's Ryan? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> And obviously, those are two trends that we want to see turned around. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, but, you know, as of right now, I have to say, even though we're seeing a turnaround in the broader economy, jobs growing in the private sector, state and local public sector continues to lose tens of thousands of jobs every month. So I want to tell a bit of a story about how we got into this dilemma. And like every really good story, I have a villain. Actually, I have three villains at whose feet I want to lay the, um, the uh, at whose feet I want to lay our current budget problems. So villain number one is the recession. I want to talk briefly about how the recession hammered state finances. Villain number two is federal policymakers. I want to blame them some. And I don't want to leave out our friends uh, at, at the elected state and local level as well. The worst economic slump since the Great Depression caused by the meltdown in the housing finance system, the foreclosure crisis, um, had just this huge effect on state, state tax revenues, right? Less jobs, 
Less wages means less income taxes coming in. Less consumer confidence means less sales taxes coming in. Declining property values hits the property tax really hard. So uh, the next slide I'm going to show you, I'm going to skip ahead two slides and show you uh, uh, the trend in state revenue collections since the beginning of the recession back in 2007 and compare it with the previous two recessions. And what you, two th important things about this, let's go one more. Actually, let's go back one. Uh, two important things about this slide. So uh, the red line is what's happened since 2007. One is that you see we bottomed out far below any of the previous recessions. In fact, the fall off in revenue was the worst uh, since at least the 1950s. Uh, revenues on average were 12% below pre-recession levels. But we know anyone here from California or Florida or Nevada or Arizona, Florida, states like that, much worse, 20%, 25% declines in revenues. And the second thing you see is how long and slow this recovery is, how long it's taking for revenues to come, to come back. We're still 6% below pre-recession levels. Now, two things helped. Revenues would have fallen even further if it were not for the fact that a number of states took steps to fill in the gap. They said, we're not just going to cut the budget. We're not just going to cut services. We're not just going to get fu cut funding for stuff that communities and families know is so important. We're going to look at the revenue side of the budget, too. 31 states raised taxes to at least some degree. Some of them were small things. Some of them were pretty significant revenue packages in the states shown in dark blue. So that was a really important component of avoiding uh, cuts being even worse in those states. So the second piece of why things weren't even worse at the state level over the last couple of years, up through 2011, was the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And I, I said this was a story about villains. And we all know that there's two kinds of villains in every story. There's those who are bad from the very beginning. And there are those who become bad over time. And from the perspective of state budgets in the recession, the federal government started off in a pretty good place. In early 2009, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act uh, uh, provided uh, about $140 billion in temporary emergency aid to state governments to fend off budget cuts that otherwise would have been uh, even more devastating on public services than they were. And I know that you all played a major role in securing those funds, so I thank you for that. Um, the problem is that the federal aid was temporary. Uh, it had its biggest effect in 2010, a slightly smaller effect in 2011. In the current fiscal year, the year we're in, the aid to states from the federal government is almost all gone. And that's a big reason why we've seen such big cuts in the current um, um, year in so many states, even as the economy has started, started to recover. And of course, Congress has rejected proposals by the President and others to extend this aid. So that's the big part of the reason why I'm calling the federal government villain number two in this story. The other part of the reason the federal government is a villain is because of what we got coming down the pike. And of course, we don't know exactly what's coming down the pike. But depending on the, what happens over about the next 10 months, there is a big possibility that the actions of the federal government could make the state budget picture and the ability of states and localities to pay for services um, could make that picture a whole lot worse. So last summer, you may remember the big fight over the debt ceiling. Um, uh, you remember there, there was a deal reached that would have, uh, that to avoid having the U.S. government, there's a fly going crazy right around me. Just, what is with him? I know. I found is that a Republican fly? We're getting ready to hit no, I was just asking. Bottle. Thank uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. So you all remember that there was a U.S. government near meltdown um, on its debt obligations. A default on our debt would have meant um, massive economic repercussions. They would have haunted our children and our grandchildren for decades. We came up to the brink of that. We backed away. But the deal we got to prevent that, after all those meetings of the super committee, which failed to reach consensus, was uh, this thing called the Budget Control Act, uh, which put in place a series of very large cuts, mostly in the category of non-defense discretionary spending that phase over time. Now, non-defense discretionary is, of course, a phrase that uh, only a budget want could love. It sounds, uh, you know, sounds innocuous, maybe. How bad could it be? But this is the category of the budget that covers almost everything the federal government does that isn't defense 
and isn't an entitlement and isn't Medicaid. Uh, it's everything from the FBI to the State Department to cancer research, housing, homelessness prevention, the IRS, environmental protection, uh, public safety grants, FEMA, the Fire Administration, and so on. What the Budget Control Act did not do was tell Congress how to achieve these cuts. So we don't know yet what's going to get cut, especially because of the bulk of them actually don't start taking effect until January 2013. This is the so-called sequestration that you've heard about. As significant as the cuts under the Budget Control Act are, they are dwarfed by the impacts of what would happen if Chairman Ryan's proposed budget, which he released last week, were to take effect. So one part of the Ryan budget is another big cut in this category of non-defense discretionary, or NDD, as we say. Um, another is a one-third cut in Medicaid by 2022. And let me just say, the only way that Medicaid grants to states could be cut by one-third is if states themselves were either to, uh, to fill in the gap. It would force states to, um, to put a huge more share of their own resources towards funding uh, health care for the poor, which of course would take a lot of money away from everything else. And there are other massive cuts in aid to states as well that again would just uh, uh, would put states in the terrible position of having to make very difficult decisions about fun, uh, how to fund programs. And you see here, back on the topic of NDD for a second, um, you see what has been sort of a long, slow decline, the blue line, uh, starting in 1976 through the, uh, through the 80s, flat in the 90s, uh, a big spike in the Recovery Act uh, in the form of stimulus aid, um, and then what would have been the dotted line, a slow decline, uh, uh, but relatively um, reasonable decline in non-defense discretionary to share the economy, the combination of the BCA caps, uh, and if enacted, Chairman Ryan's budget would take us down so that the federal government, outside of entitlements and defense, would be by far the smallest it has been in many, many decades with a commensurate impact on its ability to pay for important stuff. So what's going to happen? Well, it's all about timing. Uh, uh, I said in the next 10 months are going to be critical. The new fiscal year, federal fiscal year begins in October, but there's just going to be a stopgap spending measure. The big stuff's going to happen right after the election. Uh, we're going to hit that debt ceiling again. Uh, uh, Chairman Ryan and others have indicated they're aiming for another big showdown over that. Uh, the Bush tax cuts and the payroll tax cuts will expire in, in January 2012. And then, as I said a moment ago, these, this next round of sequestration budget cuts effect in 2013. What this means is that it's going to be deal-making time in Washington. November, the only way for the big cut of NDD not to take, uh, uh, not for NDD not to take a massive hit is for there to be a major negotiated deal that, number one, eases those caps, number two, raises new revenues, which the federal government sorely needs. We have one of the lowest overall rates of, of taxation among industrialized nations, and we've got massive tax breaks and tax credits that, uh, for corporations and the wealthy. Uh, and number three is the price for new revenues, some level of entitlement reform. That's the only way we're going to avoid um, having these cuts in non-defense discretionary spending. So it's going to be, you know, the, right after the election when everybody's exhausted from all the campaigning, there's going to be serious deal-making time uh, here in D.C. Let me talk briefly about state policymakers and then talk about what we can do about this gloomy picture. I would love to talk about Rick Scott uh, uh, ad infinitum, but let me skip ahead. I mentioned earlier that state policymakers in 2008 and 2009 did a relatively good job of raising new revenues to help deal with budget gaps. Well, then there was this election in 2010. Um, Newly elected governors and legislators in a surprising number of states not only are refusing to identify new revenue sources to make up for the continuing slowness in revenues, but a lot of them are actually pr proposing massive new tax cuts. Governors in Maine and Kansas and Oklahoma have actually proposed repealing entirely their state's personal income tax, which provides up to half of the funding. For, uh, for all the services that states provide. And just as a reminder, what do states spend their money on? Healthcare, education, public safety, transportation. That's 80% of the average state's budget. Entirely repealing the, um, the, the personal income tax would have a devastating effect on all those services and would be highly, highly fiscally irresponsible. 
Um, Florida has already enacted a major uh, package of business tax breaks. In state after state, these are being sold as an economic development tool. Remember, I, you know, it's all, you guys know, it's all about jobs at the state level. And they're saying, cut taxes, I'll create jobs. And in fact, these tax cuts would have completely the opposite effect. They would take away money out of local communities, out of uh, the hands of, of local workers, uh, local businesses. And even more importantly, they would undermine the long-term economic competitiveness of our communities by destroying infrastructure, education, public safety, and other things that we all know are the essential ingredients of long-term economic growth. The other big category of dangers, I think, at the state level is what's going to be on the ballot in November. And I know that public sector workers are already facing huge challenges on the ballot in November in terms of, uh, in terms of, of referendum and initiatives. But in addition to all of those that will be on so many ballots, Florida will have on the ballot a measure that a highly restrictive anti-government spending measure that over time would guarantee that state and local governments would have insufficient revenue to meet their obligations and to protect and support their communities. And a whole host of additional revenue measures are threatened in states all across the country, as you can see on the map. Um, I don't know if all these are going to actually make it to the ballot, but if they do, they are real wolves in sheep's clothing. Voters are going to need to be educated about what they will really do in order for these to be defeated. And that's going to be just a huge challenge in an, uh, in a, in an election where obviously so many uh, um, organizations are fighting existential battles for their own survival. Real challenges ahead. So what's the solution? Well, I certainly don't have all the answers, but let me suggest a couple of things. The alternative to the all cuts approach that puts all the burden of solving budget problems on the shoulders of workers and families and communities has to be a balanced approach. A balanced approach like what the governors in Connecticut and Maryland and Illinois have taken. Not just cutting, 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 but also closing tax breaks and tax loopholes that benefit profitable corporations. Restoring top tax rates on the wealthiest 1% or 3% of the population. A balanced approach that doesn't turn over the hard job of crafting a state budget to a formula that over time erodes the ability of the state to do anything. The other part of the solution, I think, is for people to come together around positive solutions to our economic problems. And I say this because I've seen it. Look, I'm a budget guy. I'm a budget analytic guy. Uh, I work with numbers. But, the organization, but my organization and the organizations I work with around the country, which are described, they're part of a network that we coordinate called the State Fiscal Analysis Initiative. It's, it's a catchy name for a catchy bunch of people. Um, you know, again, we're analytic types. But we figured out a little while back that having facts at our figures at our disposal to win these arguments isn't enough. It's crucial, but it's not enough. So that's why I'm really thrilled to report that these organizations, uh, as well as many of you in 35 states, have come together to form coalitions. Better Choices New Mexico, Together North Carolina, One Connecticut, Our Oregon, great uh, organizations of people, organizations coming together around common principles, common message, a common vision of adequate revenue to protect public services that will help families and help communities uh, and, and really create the ground, lay the groundwork for a sustainable and equitable uh, growing economy into the future. So I really appreciate you all's time. Uh, I, I encourage you, if uh, you're not already familiar with, uh, with my organization or the network that we work with, uh, feel free to be in touch with you. I'm sure the, the, the good folks who have organized this conference can do that. Um, uh, I really feel very surprisingly, despite all the challenge we face, very upbeat, because I think hard times bring people together and equip us all better for the fights ahead. So uh, my best wishes to all of you for a, a successful conference, uh, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.